let's take a look at Kepler's laws of planetary motion and the conditions for Newton's universal law of gravitation. So Kepler. Johannes Kepler lived from 1571 to 1630. And that is before Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton lived from 1643 to 1727. So when we talk about Kepler, I want you to keep in mind, he did all of his work before Newton, which is kind of amazing. We'll see why in a moment. Um, Johannes Kepler was Polish. His life was completely upended by war. Uh, he lived in a time when Europe, that part of Europe especially, was in continual upheaval. Um, there was a lot of religious strife surrounding him. Uh, there was a lot of sickness, both in himself and in those around him. But despite all of this, he found patterns in the motions of the planets that are now known as Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And again, he did this before Newton. He did not have access to the concept of force or Newton's universal law of gravitation or even calculus. But he built on the ideas of Copernicus and he used the data of a man named Tycho Brahe, and that was a whole other story. But it was Kepler that brought all of this together and found these patterns. So let's look at the first law. Kepler's first law of planetary motion is that each planet moves in an ellipse with the sun at a focus. So what the heck is a focus? To explain, I'm going to draw three ellipses here. And for each ellipse, I'm going to draw some dots um, inside the ellipses. For the ellipse over here, this elongated ellipse, notice that the two focuses, the two dots, focuses or foci is the plural, um, are far apart when it's a very elongated ellipse. If the ellipse is not as elongated, the foci are pretty close together. And for a circle, a circle is just a special case of an ellipse where the two foci are at the same point. They're co-located. That's how planets move around the sun. They move in an ellipse with the sun at one of the foci. And I'm also going to show here, this is the semi-major axis of an ellipse. That'll come up later. Kepler's second law of planetary motion is that a line connecting the sun and the planet will sweep out equal areas in equal times. I'll draw a picture of what this is trying to say. Here's an elliptical orbit with the sun at, one of, at a focus. And I'm going to draw point 1 and point 2 for the planet in its orbit, and then point 3 and point 4 for the planet in its orbit. What this law is saying is that if this area right here for when the planet goes from 1 to 2, this area that's swept out by a line connecting the planet and the sun, if that area is the same as the area here that's swept out by a line connecting the sun and the planet when it goes from 3 to 4, if those areas are the same, then it takes the same amount of time to go from 1 to 2 as it does to go from 3 to 4. So what's that telling us is if it takes the same amount of time to go from 1 to 2 and from 3 to 4, because those are equal areas, then the planet is moving faster when it's closer to the sun, and the planet is moving more slowly when it's further from the sun. And this law tells us exactly how much faster and exactly how much slower it's moving at each point. All right. And then Kepler's third law of planetary motion is that the period of the planet squared is proportional to the semi-major axis of its orbit cubed. Okay, that's a lot of words. Um, now, proportional really just means that t squared is equal to some constant times the semi-major axis cubed. That's all that proportional means. Um, and we can simplify this for a circular orbit. In a circular orbit, this reduces to the period squared is proportional to the radius of the circular orbit cubed. It is amazing that Kepler figured out these laws of planetary motion just by observing the motion of the planets. But there he is. He did it. However, we can cheat. We have Newton's universal law of gravitation and our knowledge of forces. Um, and using that, we can find Kepler's third law 
without having to look at the motion of the planets. And I'll show you what I mean. So um, if we're thinking about an orbit, and let's do a circular orbit for simplicity. Uh, if we're thinking about a circular orbit, the centripetal force is a gravitational force, right? And for a centripetal force, we can say that it's equal to mv squared over r. And the gravitational force, Newton's universal law of gravitation, tells us that it's g m1 m2 over r squared. All right. So those two things are equal. And we can cancel out one of the masses. The mass that cancels out is the mass of the moving object, the mass of the planet. And so we're left here. And I can solve for v squared. And then I can replace v with 2 pi r over t, t being the period. OK. Do a little algebra. And now I can solve for t squared. And if I do, t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g m2 times r cubed. And what do you know? 4 pi squared over g m2, that's constant. So that's Kepler's third law. t squared is equal to some constant times r cubed. Now, I did that in less than like a minute using our knowledge of Newton's universal law of gravitation and circular motion. We cheated. Kepler didn't have any of that knowledge, but he figured it out, which is pretty amazing that he did that. Um, but now we're able to do it really quickly because we have these powerful tools that were invented after Kepler's death. All right. Now, let's move on to the conditions for Newton's universal law of gravitation. Technically, to apply Newton's universal law of gravitation, we have to assume that the masses involved are points. Now, in reality, things aren't points. The Earth is not a point. The Sun is not a point. The Moon is not a point. Things are not points. But um, that is the assumption in Newton's universal law of gravitation. So how the heck do we use it then? If things aren't points, <laughs> how can we use this law? Well, it turns out it's a very, very good approximation when the distance between the objects is much, much greater than their length, width, or height, their dimensions. And this is true for planets, stars, moons. Planets, moons, they are so far apart that their sizes, their dimensions, their length, widths, and heights are negligible compared to the distances between them. So for astronomical objects, the assumption that masses are points, or sorry, excuse me, the approximation that masses are points is actually a really good approximation. So we got that going for us. Also, turns out that you can show, using math that we're not going to use, or not, we're not going to show it here, but you can show that Newton's universal law of gravitation also applies perfectly when the masses are spherically symmetric. So if we talk about objects that are spherically symmetric, Newton's universal law of gravitation works perfectly if we assume that the mass is all concentrated at the center of the object. Or in other words, we assume that the mass is just a point object at the center of that object. And fortunately, stars, planets, the Earth, the Moon are pretty darn close to spherically symmetric. So in many cases, we can assume that, say, the Earth is sp perfectly spherically symmetric, and we'll get pretty darn close to the reality of the situation. But uh, it's also important that the Earth is not uniformly spherically symmetric. Um, certain parts of the Earth have a greater density than other parts of the Earth. And in fact, this causes, say, the value of the gravitational field to be a little different in some places around the Earth than in other places around the Earth. And these changes in the gravitational field strength around the surface of the Earth allows scientists to figure out areas where there's a greater density in the Earth over here than there is over here, say. And that allows scientists to find mineral deposits in the Earth. It's one of the ways that scientists do that. Or, say, oil and gas deposits. But 
if we are talking about an astronomical body that is not spherically symmetric, like, say, the asteroid Eros, which is a very lumpy object, looks a little bit like this, um, we cannot assume that it's spherically symmetric. And in order to figure out the gravitational field around this, or close to this object, we need to do a little more complicated math that's beyond this.